Welcome to Direct Talk Interviews with leaders, visionaries, and pioneers who are shaping Asia and the rest of the world. Our guest today is documentary photographer Noriko Hayashi. She has worked in dozens of countries, including Liberia, Cambodia, and Iraq, and has won various international awards for photojournalism. In Kyrgyzstan, she reported on the custom of bride kidnapping, where women are stolen from their homes and forced to marry. In Pakistan, she chronicled women who were the victims of acid attacks by men seeking revenge. Hayashi's goal is to capture the real lives of people in the places she visits. We asked her more about her thoughts and her photos and what drives her to continue her work. There are photojournalists who want to go where the latest news story is. But I like to focus on a person, a family. I want to understand how they think, their everyday lives. My personal interest makes me want to tell their story to the world. These photos show happy-looking couples. But they are all cases where the wife was kidnapped and coerced into marriage. Hayashi has photographed many couples like these in the Central Asian nation of Kyrgyzstan. It's a mountainous place. Over 40% of the land sits at an altitude of 3,000 meters or higher. And some people still practice a nomadic way of life. It's believed that 30 to 40% of married women in this country were abducted brides. In 2012, Hayashi began chronicling this custom of bride kidnapping. Before long, she witnessed one of these kidnappings as it was happening. It was shocking. A man and his friends came back to his home with a woman. In Kyrgyzstan, the woman is kidnapped and taken to the man's house. Then if she continues to resist, it's not okay to force her into the marriage. Those are the rules. In the case of this girl named Farida, they tried to persuade her, but she kept saying, I have a fiancé, I have a boyfriend, I'm absolutely not getting married to you. She said that again and again. Farida continued to refuse the marriage, and 12 hours after being kidnapped, her brother came to her rescue, and they returned together to their family house. But Hayashi says that in most cases, it's difficult for the woman to refuse. 22-year-old Dinara is one of those women. She was a university student who dreamed of working abroad. She was walking through a town in the southern part of the country when a history teacher named Ahmad, who had fallen in love at first sight with her 10 days earlier, kidnapped her. His female relatives tried to persuade her. Right now, you're crying and saying no. But once you get married, you'll definitely be happy. You'll be fine. That's what they told her. And another important reason women enter into these marriages is that once you enter into a man's house, you're considered to have lost your purity. You're judged by society. Dinara said her parents called her and said, you must accept this marriage. So after about six hours of this in the man's house, she told them she would get married, and they set the formalities in motion. The very day after she was kidnapped, Dinara married Ahmad. Hayashi continued to spend time with Dinara and follow her everyday life. I asked her, why did you agree to get married in the end? She said, it's the tradition here in Kyrgyzstan. We had those kinds of conversations. Then in February 2014, she had a baby girl. I asked her, what would you think if someday your daughter were kidnapped? She said, I have a happy life, and I love my husband so much. But if someday someone came and tried to kidnap my daughter, I would never let that happen. That answer left a big impression on me. Bride kidnapping is prohibited by law in Kyrgyzstan and carries a maximum penalty of 10 years in prison. But the law is rarely enforced. Once the marriage takes place, 
it's considered a private matter for the families. There are many heart-wrenching stories. Uros, a 19-year-old university student, was abducted by a complete stranger, married in spite of her refusal, and raped. Her parents rescued her a few days later, but the following day, she killed herself. Urus's abductee was sentenced to six years in prison. The term in the Kyrgyz language for this custom of bride kidnapping is alakachu, literally to snatch away or carry off. I interviewed couples who had married by alakachu 50 years ago, and apparently, originally, it was more like if a man wanted to marry a woman his parents didn't approve of, he would elope with her, they'd go together. But over the 20th century, it gradually became okay to ignore the wishes of the woman and coerce her into marriage. That way of doing things became more and more common. These days, the man grabs a woman off the side of the road, stuffs her in his car, and drives her to his home. The old couples told me, this isn't what alakachu is supposed to be. I saw these bride kidnappings firsthand, and these women really did not want to marry. It was evident to my eyes. I believe it's a violation of human rights. Hayashi's photographs earned acclaim for capturing a shocking custom and the resilience of the women subjected to it. She won photojournalism awards in the U.S. and France. Noriko Hayashi became a photographer in 2006. It all started when she studied abroad in the West African nation of the Gambia as an exchange student with the University of Pennsylvania in the U.S. After her course of study was finished, she showed up unannounced at a local newspaper company. I had come all the way to the Gambia. I wanted to know more about the country. I thought about what I should do, and it seemed like working for a newspaper would be the best idea. I went to the editor and asked, is there something I could do here? I happened to have a camera with me. The editor saw it and asked, can you take pictures? I said, sure, I mean, all I have to do is press the button. The editor said, okay, then starting tomorrow, you're working for us as a photographer. That's how I started taking photographs. At the time, the Gambia was under the dictatorial rule of Yahya Jameh. Freedom of the press was severely restricted. Being a journalist in the Gambia was a very dangerous job. If you wrote an article about negative aspects of the country or a column criticizing the president, you could be arrested all of a sudden. There were journalists that just disappeared. These journalists had things they really wanted to say, but they couldn't really say them. I looked at them and thought, I want to do work in regions where people don't have a voice. Focus on the individuals who aren't usually the focus. Chronicle them, photograph them, and get their stories out there. I felt very strongly that that was the kind of work I wanted to do. Eventually, Hayashi started working as a freelance documentary photographer. In July 2010, she headed to Pakistan. Her focus was the women there who had been victims of acid attacks. Their faces bore the terrible scars of their assault. I photographed women who had had sulfuric acid thrown in their faces by men, by their husbands. Maybe they rejected a marriage proposal. Maybe it was a form of domestic violence. The perpetrators were rarely punished. They make deals with the police or the judges. Or if the man was a powerful figure in the community, the woman would stay silent for fear of further reprisal. 
One of the women Hayashi photographed was 22-year-old Seida. She had only been married for four months when her 45-year-old husband threw sulfuric acid on her. Seda's husband was beating her daily. She fled to her parents' house, and he carried out the acid attack in retaliation. I was with her for three months. At first, I didn't take pictures of her. We did fun things together, went shopping, watched television. We grew closer and closer. That time we spent together was so important. As we lived our daily lives together, I saw her not as this victim of an acid attack, but as Seida, a woman, an individual. I really learned who she was as I spent this time with her. Sometimes she was angry. Sometimes something funny happened with her family and she laughed about it. She was an individual, a woman, a human being. I wanted to express that individuality, that humanity. And Seda thought about what it would mean to have her picture taken. Then she said, very firmly, I want people to know the harm that's been done to me. When she said that to me, I was so grateful. And I also knew it meant that I had to do my job properly, to do her justice. More recently, Hayashi has been working among the Yazidis, an ethnic minority group in the Middle East. Their population is estimated to be between 600,000 and 1 million, and for centuries, they have preserved a distinctive religious tradition. In August 2014, they became the victims of a horrible tragedy. Yazidi towns in northern Iraq were suddenly attacked by the extremist group Islamic State. Around 5,000 people were killed. In 2015, Hayashi traveled to Iraq to chronicle the plight of the Yazidis. She met women who had been captured by IS, but somehow managed to escape, as well as women who had become soldiers fighting to protect their villages. A Yazidi family I was interviewing was attacked by IS, and their daughters and sons began leaving for Germany. Every time I visited them in Iraq, more and more members of this family and their relatives had left the country. I wanted to record what their lives were like in Germany. And so, in 2016, Hayashi traveled to Germany and began chronicling the lives of these Yazidi refugees. When I was there, the Yazidis happened to have a wedding, and I had an opportunity to go check it out. Thousands of Yazidis who had come to Germany as refugees were crowded together in this hall. The way this group of people stood together, united, was so incredible, I thought. How would these Yazidis preserve their Yazidi identity going forward? I thought a lot about that question. What was their traditional lifestyle? What had been important to them? The Yazidi religion, the Yazidi identity had been handed down by their ancestors. I'm spending time with them, researching those questions as one big project. I intend to continue doing that. The key is in the time you spend not taking photos. I spend a lot of time interviewing my subjects, interacting with them. I'm not holding my camera. I talk with them, see the faces they show me in more relaxed moments. I see that and I think, okay, I need a picture of a moment like that. I've experienced that many times. It's the things I see when I don't have my camera, the thoughts and feelings of my subjects, their humanity. That time is so important. I think it helps to make my work deeper, make it more interesting.